Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye land. Sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say unto God, how terrible art thou in thy works. Though the greatness of thy power shall thy enemies submit themselves unto thee. All the earth shall worship thee and sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name. Selah means ponder, think on those things. May the Lord bless you and keep you all. The next voice you shall hear will be from Dr. Melvin Silas. Yeah, yeah, Can I get amen? Amen. amen? amen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, praise God, everyone. Praise God. Oh, man, man, that was so exciting. Let's try it again. Praise God, everyone. <laughs> I was like, man, y'all said that's so sad. I feel like going sit back down. <laughs> it's like, man, okay. Man, I pray all is well with each and every one of you. And brother Stallworth, we want to welcome you and your family. We're so glad to have you join us, you know, along with everyone else. You know, I was uh, yesterday... I had to do a birthday, you know, um, celebration. celebration where I had to, you know, give a speech. Then a couple of hours later, I had to do a wedding. But prior to that, I had learned about two, or was it three people that transitioned, yeah. okay? And I found myself asking God in the car as I was riding. It's like, Lord, how do you go from this to this? I mean, you know, I mean, really, when we're going through things, all we see at that time is what we're going through. It seems like we can't see any light ahead, if you understand what I'm saying. And I just pondered that. I said, because, you know, I'm here, I'm at a birthday celebration where people are joyous, I'm going to a wedding where after birth is the most joyous, you know, thing that you could have, and you have me standing before these people, I'm looking at everyone smiling, but in my mind I'm thinking about the, you know, the two or three families that have just lost loved ones, okay? And I just couldn't get over that. And so... I was still, last night when it came in, I was still thinking on that. And this morning, I was, you know, because I always pray and ask God what he wants me to give you. See, because if I give you what I want you to have, that, that, that doesn't mean it's what God wants you to have, if you understand what I'm saying. And so God reminded me of a message I taught a long time ago, a while back, a while back. And the title of that message was Caught Between a Rock and in a hard place, all right? But he gave me so much more information this morning on this, and he's still pouring information into me about that. You know, because, see, there's times that we find ourselves, you know, in places where there is no human answer. I mean, you really, we try to figure it out, we try to get it resolved, but there's no way that we can accomplish it. You know, and when I say that, I'm talking about being in a place where you know you can't go back. Being in a place where you know where you're at, you don't want to be. Being in a place where you know there's a better place, but you can't find a way to get there. That's what I'm talking about, okay? Because, see, as Christians, a lot of us, we go through that, but we don't want to ever share that we're going through that because I believe you, you, we, we think it makes us feel unspiritual. But it makes you human, okay? That's what it does. It makes you human, you know? So when we find ourselves in a place like that, what is it that we do? I mean, really, you can't go forward, you can't go backwards, you're not comfortable where you're at, you want to go somewhere else, but you don't know how to get there, you don't want to be who you are today, but you want to be somewhere else because you know you could be better, and you just don't know how. How do you get there? How do you get there? 
See, this is a question that I believe many Christians have asked and are still asking. Okay? How do you get there? You know, being caught between a rock and a hard place. See, I used to um, hear my mom, you know, I'm going I'm to I'm date myself. <laughs> I used to hear my mom and dad say that, you know, when I was growing up, and, you know, being between a rock and a hard place, being between a rock and a hard place. You know, and then they had that other saying, I'm just in a pickle, you know. And I didn't understand it. I didn't understand it, but now I understand it. See, when a person uses the expression caught between a rock and a hard place, it means that that person is cornered with no escape, all right? No apparent solution. They are between two extreme situations where neither one of them seems good. Think about that. Mm -hmm. I See, I be talking to y'all, but see, y'all be trying to play it off like y'all ain't experienced this, so I'm just going to talk to me. I've been there. I've been there. I'm like, man, can't turn left, can't turn right, can't go forward, can't go back. And I'm like, what is going on? Okay. As I said, I, I preached this message a while back, but God has given me so much this morning, just this morning, you know, about this. And I need you, Holy Spirit. I need you. Let it be none of me, but all of you. Let this message, Lord God, not only penetrate the ears and the hearts of the people listening but Lord my heart also turning your Bible to Ephesians chapter 6 mm. and as you turn there I'll give you a little history on that particular passage of scripture and myself oh maybe about 35 years ago or longer I was in a real terrible situation and I remember I was um coming out of Tennessee <laughs> the lights on the vehicle had came on all right I didn't have that much money I had just enough to come from Tennessee back to California and I'm driving and all the lights on the dashboard come on just and I'm like man so I find me a hotel room I'm saved I go in and I'm like man Lord what, what's going on with this you know I have just enough money I'm talking about I had just enough money to come from Tennessee to California that when I hit the grapevine, Jackie, I was going to be on fumes from there. I had, it, I had it down that close, okay? And so now I'm looking at a tragedy. And I went in the room. I had my Bible in my hand. And I fell across the bed. And the Bible opened up on the floor because it fell on the floor. And it opened up to this passage. And then I'm going to read it from, God, from God's word. You might have the King James or New King James, but whatever version you have, trust me, we're going to end up in the same place. Finally, receive your power from the Lord and from his mighty strength. Put on all the armor that God supplies. In this way, you can take a stand against the devil, against his strategy. This is not a wrestling match against human opponents. We are wrestling with rulers, authorities, the powers who govern this world of darkness and spiritual forces that control evil in the heavenly world. For this reason, take up all the armor that God supplies. Then you will be able to take a stand against, against the enemy during these evil days. Once you have overcome all your obstacles, you will be able to take a stand during these evil days. So then, take your stand, fasten truth around your waist. Okay, and we know that now it goes on to tell you about the armor of God, right? But I want to break down a few things to you. Finally. I want you to think about that word, finally. Finally means after you have exhausted every avenue that you can, after you have finished thinking it out, planning it out, trying to figure it out, God says, after you've done all of that, he says, then receive my power. All 
All right. Receive my power. That's what he says. Receive my power, the power that comes from the Lord. What does that mean? Sometimes we can try to think certain things out. We can just burn our minds. We can stay up walking the float late at night. We could do all of these things and still come up with nothing. He says, when you're finished doing what you can do, let me do what I can do. That's what God says. And that night in that hotel room, when God showed me this, he says, finally, my brother, the King James reads like this. Finally, my brother, when you've done all to stand, stand. I couldn't understand that. I was like, what do you mean after I've done all to stand? I'm telling you now I can't stand. But then you tell me over here to still stand. Because in between the finally and the next finally, he's saying you should have enough sense to receive the power that I have given you, what I have supplied to you. You should pull on that now that you see that what you are trying to work with won't work with no more. Won't work no more. <laughs> what it's saying is after you have exhausted every avenue, after you have tried everything, you know how to try. After you have exhausted every human possibility to get this rectified, to get out of it, to go forward, to just move out of that place, and you cannot do it. It should tell you that you have no ability to do it. God is the only one that has the ability to do it. But sometimes we'll still fight. And you know where that comes from? Independence. We want to be independent. But see, it's nothing wrong with being independent, but what, when it becomes wrong is when you try to be, become independent from God. That's when it becomes wrong. Because God desires to fight for you. God desires to see you come out of situations where humanly possible you could not come out of. Why? Because God gets the glory. He gets the glory. And that's what he wants. He wants people to say, ooh, only God could have done that. AJ, only God could have done that. Do you see what I'm saying to you? He wants you to release whatever situation, whatever circumstance, whatever you're faced with. He wants you to release it to him so that he can step up and step in. Let me give you a better example. We had to have called some plumbers to look at some stuff at our house. All right. I'm not a plumber. Brother Star, without you know, I told my wife, plumbing and paint is what I do not want to do. <laughs> and it's not only because I, I don't want to do it, I can't do it, okay? So I tried, and it's still messed up. So she decided, she said, let me call some professionals. Thank you, Jesus. See, because I had exhausted everything that I knew how to do. YouTube, plumbing help books. You understand me? All of that. I have, you know, you know how we are, brothers. Come on now. We want to be smart in front of the women. You understand me? And I'm like, man, it ain't nothing but a leak. I mean, what, what how, how, you know, how hard could that be? It was hard enough that I could not fix it. With everything that I tried, all the knowledge I tried to obtain, all the ability I exerted, it ain't still leaking today. And she reminded me this morning, you know, it's still leaking. I said, at the promise coming tomorrow? She said, yeah. But see, she had to call someone into our situation to fix it. See, a lot of times when you're fighting things, you don't give God an invitation to step into your problems. See, you got to invite him in. You got to say, Lord, look here. Ha, my hands is up. I can't do this. And I need divine intervention. I need you to come into this situation, Lord. I need you to take control. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when they say finally, that's what God is talking about. All right? After you've exhausted everything you can do. Then when we look at Ephesians 6, when we look at Ephesians 6, come on in, Tony. When we look at Ephesians 6, it tells us also, it says, that we fight against not human opposition, but we're fighting against spiritual opposition, okay? 
So your fight is not with your boss. Your fight is not with your wife or your husband. Your, your fight is against spiritual principalities because it says it right here in Ephesians 6. It says, let me read it for those of you that may not know what it says. It says, this is, a, this is not a wrestling match against human opponents. We are wrestling with rulers, authorities, the powers who govern this dark, the darkness in this world. All right, spiritual forces that cannot that cannot be controlled except by allowing God to work in your life. Okay? So you got to know who you're fighting. You got to know who you're fighting. See, it, 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 you know, I don't know if any of you seen for the last week or two, they had this um, documentary on with Muhammad Ali. And I've been watching it. Man, it's been amazing. I didn't know he went through all of this. I, I really didn't. And I mean, it's, it's a long series, but man, I, I, I went through all of it with him. And I was like, my God. And one thing that, 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 that I seen in this man, he trusted God in his situation. He really did. And I didn't even know that he was the only person that has ever won the world championship three times. I didn't know that. I knew the two. But what the point that I'm trying to bring out is I looked at the determination in this man. And we as Christians should have that same determination to have a happy family, to get along with one another. We should have that same determination. You know, when I married that couple yesterday, the one thing that I told them, and I said, if you leave out of here with anything from me today, I said, you, you remember this. Never go to bed angry. Because you definitely going to wake up angry. Ain't that right, babe? We learned that. Yeah. See, see, Pastor, Pastor first, they going to tell you the truth. We, 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 went, we went to bed many times angry. And we woke up angry. She be in the kitchen cooking breakfast, sis. And you can hear the, you know how y'all do, hear the pot slamming. Ba bam, ba bam. I'm like, man, I was sleeping. What was going on? Cabinet slamming. And then I come downstairs, good morning. I'm like, Lord Jesus, come on, let's tell the truth. Yes, sir. See, never go to bed angry, all right? But her enemy wasn't me. It was not me. And she was not my enemy. The enemy that we both were fighting were the influence that, that the enemy had put into us. And when I say put into us, it's thoughts. How can he do that to me? You, I'm grown. How are you going to say it anyway? Y'all looking at me like I'm the only one. Y'all better tell the truth. Y'all better tell the truth. We here for deliverance, boy. Look at here. <laughs> yeah, right. But we did that for many years because I did not know who I was to fight. Do you understand what I'm saying? I did not know who I was to fight. So I was fighting her, she was fighting me and nothing was getting accomplished, okay? Until we got the realization that we need to pray about what we're battling about. Not to sit here and go head to head with each other because we never solved anything. So what I'm telling you, when you find yourself in a place caught between a rock and a hard place, you know, you got to release that situation to God. You got to ask him to come into your situation. And when God comes into your situation, he's looking for that. Let me give you another example. See, I like examples. I had, when I was growing up, I had a stepbrother, right? He was way older than me, right? And I was going, I was in high school. And, uh, man, I was going to get beat up after school. I ain't no, wasn't no doubt about this one. Because I had made a whole bunch of people mad. <laughs> So I went to the pay phone and called my brother because he grown. You know, he big, grown. I said, man, they're going to jump me out of school. He said, I'll be there. So there was a football game that particular Friday. <laughs> and so I'm heated out way back on the back of the bleachers. So I see my grown brother and two of his friends coming in. Oh, I popped all the way out. <laughs> oh, hey, here I am. Hey, yeah, 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 y'all rush me now. Rush me now. See, you got to know that your big brother Jesus wants to do the same thing in your life. See, but you got to call him in. You got to bring him into that situation so that he can prevail the way he wants to prevail. 
It says you should overcome all obstacles. See, we have three main obstacles, people. One is fear. Fear is something that just 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 overwhelms people. And sometimes we be afraid and don't even know what we're afraid of. Okay. That's true. I mean, really. And this is this is what we got to think about. The Bible says that God has not given you the spirit of fear. So in that particular verse in First Timothy, it tells you he has not given you the spirit of fear. It identifies fear as a spirit. So if he, it is a spirit and he didn't give you that spirit, then you know where it came from. Now, there's going to be times you're going to have, you know, you, you, you're going to have a moment of fear. You know, I, I get it when Christians, I really trip when Christians say, hey, living a life of no fear. I'm, I'm like, my God, you must be living outside of humanity. Because there's times when you will have a challenging fear. But what I'm trying to tell you, do not stay in the place of fear. Do you see what I'm saying? Don't stay in the place of fear. When you recognize that you're moving in a place of fear, you're going to have to open up your mouth and say, no, 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 this ain't the place for me to hang out. Amen. God got a strong place for me to hang out. Yes, you're going to have to start talking to yourself because, see, when the devil is talking you into fear, he's in your head. And you know how he gets in your head? By your own voice. Well, the last time this happened, this is what happened and this is what happened, or either... When it happened to so and so, I remember what happened to them. I mean, you got to start saying, "Look, I don't know what happened to so and so. I'm sorry it happened to so and so, but I ain't gonna stand in this place of fear." Do you see what I'm saying to you? Oh, y'all looking at me again? <laughs> Listen, people, we got to learn that when we're caught between a rock and a hard place, what we need to do. When it seems like it's no, 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 and when it seems like it's impossible to go forward, it's impossible to go backwards, it's impossible to move in any direction. What are we going to do when we find ourselves stuck there? We're going to invite God in. That's what we're going to do. We're going to invite God in. We're going to say, God, look, I know I can't do this. I have tried. But Lord, I need you. I need your wisdom. I need your direction. I will not let fear. I will not let confusion. I will not let doubt hinder me from hearing from you. See, because see, fear, doubt, and confusion are the three things that you have to overcome. You know, then we, we, we have people that talk about they fighting the devil. Don't y'all get mad at me out there. <laughs> Don't y'all get mad at me about what I'm about to say. I want you to follow along with me. Now, I'm going to say it slow. Why are you fighting the devil and he's already been defeated? Okay. The Bible says the only fight that you have is the good fight of faith. That's, That's, That's like when I was watching Muhammad Ali, I thought about this. Story. Well, he had laid one cat all the way out on his back. The cat was laid out and he was jerking <laughs> And I said, now it would be stupid for somebody to jump in the rain and talk about, come on, get up, get up. You see the man's out. See, if you see the devil as a defeated foe, if you see him as a defeated foe, if you recognize what God has done for you, then you won't be trying to fight the devil. You'll be fighting the good fight of faith. Amen. And as apostle told me once, he said, the only good fight I ever had is the ones I won. You got to stay in a place of faith. The devil does not want your house. He does not want your car. He does not. Look, what is the devil going to do with your house? Move in? <laughs> huh? I mean, really, stop and think about it. He's going to move in. What are you going to do with your car? Drive it around? He does not want your house. He does not want your car. What he wants is your faith. That's what he wants. He wants to destroy your faith and trust in God. He wants to bring you into places of doubt. He wants to bring you in places of fear. He wants to bring you into places of confusion because now he has you on his home court. You got to stay on God's court, the court of faith. You got to open your mouth and say, I don't know how this is going to work, but I know God's going to work it. Say, I don't know when it's going to be over. 
but I know it got an expiration date. Oh, yeah. That's what you're going to have to say. You're going to have to honestly admit, say, look, I don't know when change is going to come, but I know it's on its way. Oh, you're going to have to say that. You're going to have to speak that. You're going to have to know that. And you're, you're, you're hearing it from a person that had to stand like that for years in his life. Years in his life. When I see nothing changing. Day after day, nothing changing. And I started to wonder, does the word really work? Is there really a God? I mean, my goodness, mine. I mean, I've been on there. You know, I started to talk to myself. And I didn't know I was so young in the Lord. I didn't know that I was convincing myself out of my own faith. Mm. The only fight you have is the fight with your faith, to stand in faith. And then there's those that say, I don't know if I got faith. Oh my God, why do you be? I mean, I'm so tired of hearing that. The Bible says in, Je in, in Romans 12 and 3 that God has given each one of the believers the measure of faith. Do you not know you could not even get saved without faith? And if you saved, you got faith. Hello? See, when he said just have the faith, the, uh, the seed of a mustard, have faith the size of a mustard seed, he was talking to people like me. Because he, you, if you, look, if you go and look up when you get home, Google, how big a mustard seed is, it is very, very, very small. All right? <clears throat> but the thing that is amazing, that small seed grows into a big tree. And, 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 and I'm talking about the, the, the trunk of that tree could be as big as this room. Okay? It has the ability to grow to that size. So what God is telling you, Use the faith that you have. See, every person, every one of you, the young kids, the babies that are in here, everyone, when you came into this world, you had the same exact uh, amount of muscle. <clears throat> everyone. But the more you develop your muscle, the more it grows. The more you develop your faith, the more it's going to grow. You know, again, you're going to have challenges with faith, fear, and doubt. Yeah, man, but that's what makes you a champion. Shoot. Sure. Yeah, you're going you're gonna to win some, you're going to lose some, but I hope you win more than you lose. But see, we have to be a people that, first of all, know that God loves us. See, when you truly know that God loves you, mm, thank you, Holy Spirit. When you truly know God loves you, you know that God will fight for you. You know that God will bring you out of those dark moments. That God will cover you when you need that protection. He will wrap his arms around you when you, when you need that comfort. Why do you think Holy Spirit is called the comforter? Yeah, I, I, you know, people, oh, damn, people get so spiritual, they don't even have, anyway. <laughs> the comforter. Think about it, the comforter. I know y'all got a, your favorite blanket. On the bed, you grab that blanket and wrap up in that blanket, walk through the house in that blanket to be nice and warm. The comforter. Holy Spirit wants to do that same thing with you. He wants to be able to wrap his arms around you. He wants to be able to go where you go. He wants you, he wants you to know that in your hardest moments, he's there to comfort you. He's there to love you. That's what he wants you to know. Mm. Moses and the Israelites were caught between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> and if you turn in your Bibles to Exodus 14. Oh man, thank you Jesus. I guess the reason that you see me sometimes become so passionate about a message it's because I understand the importance of it. I understand that when God dropped it into my heart to give to you, I can always feel the importance of how God wants that word delivered. And there was so much in this my, my years back I missed, man. If I had known certain things, I wouldn't have went through certain things. I, you know, and this is why I teach you this. We teach our children, just like my, my grandson, 
My wife gave him a big old roll of paper. I don't know where he got it or she got it. It's about this long, rolled up. And I'm in my office, he runs up there and got that. I said, where you get this big old piece of paper from? And he's pencil, 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 Down, you know? And so the moment I gave him something to write with, I looked and he was writing. And all I could see in my spirit is him writing his name, all right? What was he doing? He was signing his future. Because he's going to be drawing on that. He's going to see. See, I can't see what he makes out, Jonathan, but he understands it. See, some, some of you God has given big vision to. You have big dreams. But your problem is you've been talking to people with small minds. Ooh, Lord Jesus. And you want them to understand. You want them to understand your dream, your vision. I mean, really, honestly. And then you don't get it when they don't. See, you cannot take an eight by 10 picture and fit it into a five by seven frame. Stop trying. Stop trying. It's your vision. They're not supposed to see it. That's why he gave it to you. If they were supposed to see it, he'd have gave it to them too. So your dream house is your dream house. It ain't their dream house. It's not. See, what you want for your kids is what you want for your kids. They may not be able to see all your kids going to college and all their tuition paid, but you can. Do you see what I'm trying to sell you today? Huh? Exodus 14. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and saw that the Egyptians were coming after them. Now check what they said. Terrified, the Egyptians cried out to the Lord. <laughs> they said to Moses, did you bring us into the desert to die because there were no graves in Egypt? Look what you have done by bringing, bringing us up out of Egypt. Didn't we tell you, just leave us alone. Let us keep serving the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. I'm going to stop there for a minute. Little backdrop. They were in slavery for over 300 and some years. Okay? And here God sends a man to deliver them out of Egypt. They had not really heard from God in all that time. So he came, God showed miracles through Moses. Bam, bam, bam. All these miracles to get the people's attention. So now the people are led out, but before they are led out, God tells them to get from the Egyptians all that you want. Basically, I'm paraphrasing. So the Egyptians gave them gold, silver, because they wanted them out. I mean, it, look, they wanted them gone because all the things that happened through those miracles, they say, look. So I believe that when Pharaoh got to thinking about what happened and they done broke Egypt, all the goods that you know they out there with gold and stuff in the desert blinging out and, and he just sit up there and say the, the pharaoh said wait hold up we got to go get them so as they go they come to a place where the red sea is in front of them okay they happen to look behind them and they see the chariot dust so this is why they say oh my god lord help and then they start jacking up the man of God, talking about why you bring us out of here. We told you we didn't want to leave. And look at look what you did. Now you're going to get us all killed. You know how y'all do. Uh-huh. Come on. My wife done did me like that many a time. You understand know I me? Mean? Why? Yeah, I'm going to tell the truth. <laughs> she thought I stopped with her business right there. I, hey, look, look, look. Look, look, y'all. Look. Lord, tell me to do something. And I do it. And then she'd be jacking me up. And I'd be like, man, why don't you show her too, man? I mean, come on, God, you got me here riding this like this. <laughs> but you know that's the way it happens. All right, but these people were in fear. They were in fear because, look, there was no way to go forward. There was no way to go back. There was no way to go this way. There was no way to go that way. They were stuck, caught between a rock and a hard place. Mm. Verse 13. Moses answered the people, don't be afraid. Yeah, right. Don't be afraid. Stand still and see what the Lord will do 
to save you today. You will never see the Egyptians again. This scripture also, and I'll get at that, you know, a couple of weeks down the road. This scripture also played a very powerful part in my life too. When God gave me the revelation in this scripture and I was going through something, all right? He said, don't be afraid. Stand still. To stand still does not mean don't do nothing. It doesn't mean that. To stand still means to shut your mouth. Stop talking negatively about the situation. Start opening your mouth up about what God can do, not what you can't do. We understand what you can't do. That's that ain't we are not anyway. Uh, we understand, but see, you got to open your mouth up about what God can do. See, God can turn your whole situation around. You know. I keep telling people, you want a house? Start believing God for a house. Start trusting God. Well, I don't have the credit or the money. I'm like, my God, did you just hear what I said? <laughs> Do you hear what I said? I know people, I've seen people give people houses and cars, brand new cars, not no junk homes neither. Because, the, let me tell you one example. Lady had lost her house in foreclosure. So she went to the auction. Because she said she just wanted to see it sold, you know. She went to the auction. She started talking to this one lady. They didn't know each other. The lady that she was talking to bought the house. Now, the lady didn't know before she bought the house that that was the lady's house that she was talking to. So after she bought the house, she said to the lady, because they had a chance to, you know, communicate. She says, I'm glad that someone bought my home that's going to cherish it. And the lady said, what? She said, yes, that was my home. I just came down to see who it was basically going to go to. The lady looked at her and said, well, you know, I was down here to buy a home for my son. And the Lord moved on this lady's heart. And the lady said, you know what? I'm going to give you back your house. Didn't charge her one penny. Not one. Signed it back over to her for nothing. Don't tell me what God can't do. Mm-mm. Don't tell me what God can't do. I've seen people give people brand new cars. Brand new cars, man. See, you have to learn to stop limiting the ability of God because of your ability being limited. Woo! Somebody need to, somebody need to post that on Facebook so I can remember that myself. Because I know that was God. I ain't going to remember that one. <laughs> I'm like, wow, okay, Holy Ghost. <laughs> See, so here they are. And then they talk about it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians. 300 years, 300 plus years in slavery. Think about the things that, that, that have kept you in slavery before you came to the Lord. There are times that we feel that the life we used to live was a better life. Come on. Uh-huh, don't move. Don't move. All right, I'm, I'm going to talk this way. All right, that is a better life. You know when that song come on and you drive down the street, you, oh, yeah, oh, you get all happy and stuff. Come on, you know, oh, y'all act like y'all say y'all don't listen to no. I'm going to pray for y'all really after this service. I'm going to pray for all of y'all. Get that lion demon up out of here. <laughs> all right. But see, you have a tendency to think that when you're walking with God, when you're walking with him and things get hard, things get challenging. The enemy will have the opportunity to, to remind you of some times before Jesus. Okay? Yesterday at the wedding, remember your brother? They had a brother come up and sing with a, with, with a popular group, I won't name it. But I knew him, and I had him laugh, and I said, boy, look at here. That was before our pre-salvation days, you know? And, 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 and I kept looking at him, and you know, we both done got old. That's probably why he didn't recognize me, and I didn't recognize him. I know I still look the same, but anyway. <laughs> I'm going to keep my mind in faith, bro. All right. But anyway, the reason that I said that is that he can try to convince you that the life before Jesus is better than the life that you're serving. But one thing we fail to realize is we had some hard times out there without Jesus. Don't sit there and act like you didn't. Uh-huh. See, I'd rather have my hard times with Jesus because then I know I, could, I got somebody on my team that's a winner. See, what God wants you to do, and for those of you taking notes, you need to write this down. 
I heard a sister say this on our prayer channel um, last Thursday. I heard two separate women say something that caught me. It just, just what they said, it caught me. It said, learning to win at all levels. Woo! I said, man, I wrote that down. Learning to win at all levels. That's what God wants you to do is to learn to win at all levels. Now, for those that need clarity, I'm not talking about God going to make everybody a millionaire. So don't go out there and lie on me. Because, see, some people don't really want to be a millionaire. They just want to be able to take care of their home, their, 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 their family, their children, and have a few dollars to do a few things. You know? See, to them, that is being a millionaire. Do you understand? See, there are those that God will, will, will empower with that wealth to be millionaires. But everybody is not going to be one. So I'm not preaching that. I'm preaching that God desires to do exactly what he said in his word in John 10.10, 10, where he said, I have come to bring you life. And he could have stopped right there. We all would have been happy. We would have been happy right there to have life. Oh, my God, that's good. But he didn't stop there. He said, I have come to bring you life more abundantly. Not just life. I want you to have an abundant life. I want you to enjoy this life. I want you to have fun. Do you see what I'm saying? That is yours. But he says, if you read it, he says that they may. May means it's up to you. That they may have abundant life. So you have the decision to continue to live the way you've been living or you can step up and live the way God wants you to live. But the only way you're going to do that, you're going to have to get over fear. You're going to have to get over doubt. You're going to have to get over confusion. You're going to have to invite God into your situation and say, Lord, you guide me. You guide me. See, there's many times we want to guide ourselves. And we keep running into obstacles, walls and stuff like this. You know, you know. Look, my wife preached something a few years back. We call it a GPS system, global positioning system. <laughs> she called it God's positioning system. And I said, this works the same way. When he tell you to turn left, turn left. I'm serious, turn left. I was listening to the, to, 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 to the GPS a few years ago and the freeway was off and so you know I had to put it on to find out how to get you know how to block off the freeway and so it was telling me to go one way and I said oh no man I, I know better than this so I hung a right and the cars behind me they hanging rights too thinking I know where I'm going man I went into a straight dead end street <laughs> when, the th when the GPS was telling me to keep straight I thought I knew better See, sometimes we'll think we know better than God and we'll get off his pointing system, his positioning system. But by the grace of God, I was able to make a U-turn. Hey, say U-turn. Come on, say it with me. U-turn. Y'all know you need some of y'all need to make a U-turn. Say, make a U-turn. Make a U-turn. Yeah, make a U-turn and get back on course. Did I lose a few minutes? Yes, 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 yes. We'll lose some time because we got off course. But my God, you're still going to reach the destination that God has for you. So, getting back to Exodus. Moses answered the people and said, do not be afraid. Stand still and see. 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 He was challenging them. See. See. The salvation. The deliverance. The salvation. The deliverance of the Lord God. He said, these Egyptians that you see today, you will see no more. I don't know. See, you got to understand the Egyptians, see, Egypt is a type of the world in the Bible. It is what in theology school we call a type of the world. When it's speaking about Egypt, it refers to the world. When it speaks about Egyptians, it is also speaking about those that are controlled by the world. Okay? So when it says in this scripture, the Egyptians, the problems, the situations, the circumstances that the enemy has tried to create in your life. He says you will see them no more. But you have to do what? You have to first stand still. Stand still means that you stop talking so much about your situation. 
Do you hear what I'm saying? See, we got some people we like to call up on the phone. Oh, man, I'm going through this. I'm going through that. You know, man, stop that. Stop that. And then you notice how when you start doing that, they come back with, yeah, and I'm going through this and I'm going through that. And by the time you hang up the phone, both of y'all just about in tears. Stop that. Start saying what God wants to hear you say. You're not, you're not not acknowledging the situation you're in, but what you are acknowledging is the deliverance that God is going to bring into the situation. Do you see what I'm saying? See, when your car gets broken and goes to the shop, you will tell somebody, my car's in the shop, right? Won't you, Tony? Yep. But then you'll tell them, it'll be out in a few days, won't you? Yes. Uh-huh. So why can't you tell people, I'm in a situation? <laughs> but I'll be out in a few days. Huh? It's because we are not looking to God's ability. We're staying within our own. That was the first thing that I told you in this message. You have to step out of yourself and allow God to have his power, his direction, his wisdom, his ability to work through you. Do you see what I'm saying to you? See the, oh my God, man, help me, Holy Spirit, help me. Listen, I got lights all in this sanctuary. All right, but the lights are coming from what they call a panel, like in your home. You know, for you electricians, it's called a load center. Didn't think I knew that. Anyway, <laughs> listen. But I can cut the lights off here. The electricity is still there, but I chose to cut it off. How did I cut it off? Because I'm not allowing God into my situation. Do you see what I'm saying? The power is there for me. It's available for me. But I, you have to hit the switch. What hits the switch? Faith in God, trust in God. When I have faith in God and I trust God, I hit the switch. There it is. Can I get an amen? amen? It's time for you to hit the switch in your life. People I live so long, man, mixed up. Man, I'm telling you about me. Not only before I was saved, but after I was saved. I wanted a better life. I wanted things. I wanted things for my kids, for my grandkids. And, and I didn't know how. I didn't know. I didn't know what to do. And I was trying to go through the scriptures and and find what to do. I heard one pastor say this. I heard another one say that. I heard another one say this. I didn't know what to do until I got on my knees and asked God, you show me. You show me what to do. And the moment I did that, my life changed. It has never been the same. Do I have challenges? Of course. Of course. <laughs> the attacks seem like ongoing. You know, as my friend said, it seems like, man, when we get finished with one battle, we're stepping into another one. <laughs> I had it, and my response to him, that's normally what a champion boxer does. <laughs> See, you got to know. Amen? Amen? So when we look at Exodus 14, what we find is people that found themselves in a situation. They were stuck, caught between a rock and a hard place. As you continue to read that, you'll see what God did. There was a cloud that led them by day and led them by night, well, protected them by night. That cloud, when the Egyptians started to come, it moved from the front to the back to block the Egyptians from getting to God's people. And that night, it says that that entire night, God stirred the Red Sea, that the waters rose on one side and on the other to stand up. And the next day, when the people woke, there was a part in the Red Sea. See, sometimes, because we don't see God work, it does not mean God's not working. Whoo, I looked at that and I said, Lord Jesus, thank you. You see, you got to trust him. And because of Moses doing what God said, he said, take the rod. 
See, in other words, he was saying, Moses, use what's in your hand. He says, I've given you something that's in your hand. It was the rod for Moses, but for us, it is faith. He's telling you use what's in your hand. Faith. Faith. It was because of him doing what he did that parted the Red Sea that the people were able to cross. And what I like too was when the Egyptians tried to cross, God closed it up on them. You know, because remember, <laughs> God told them to go out and borrow everything from the Egyptians, right? And the Egyptians was giving them gold, silver, it was giving some stuff. So if you borrow something, there's a debt to be paid, right? Uh-huh. But you got to have somebody to owe the debt too, right? God closed the sea so they didn't have no debt. <laughs> Y'all didn't catch that. You, you get it tomorrow. <laughs> but what I'm saying to you is we have to be people of faith. And you have to help encourage one another, okay? When you hear someone going through something, encourage that person. You're going to make it out. You're going to be able to raise these kids. You're going to be able to get your home. You're going to be finding a job. You're going to have your home. Encourage them. Encourage them. That's what we do with one another. We don't need to jump into a pity party. Because when you have your pity party, I'm going to tell you something. It's only going to be two of you there. That's you and the devil. Now, anybody else that join, they're affiliated with the devil. I'm going to tell you that now. All right? Because you need to have people surround you that will encourage you. People that will pray for you, really pray for you. Don't. I'm not talking about them folks that ain't seen you in two months and then they see, oh, I was just praying for you, lying devil. Got my phone number, you ain't called me. You know? See, I'm not talking about that. You've got to find people that's going to really pray for you. You're going to have to get into the Bible. The older you, you're going to have to bring your family together and pray, man. I'm not talking about having a church. You don't look at me that way. I ain't talking about, I ain't talking about having a whole church service now. Let me get it cleared up. <laughs> Some of y'all get in there and had whole kids and family in about two hours. <laughs> no, I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about having a short prayer. Father, thank you for blessing my family. Continue to bless my family. Watch over there. That's it. And keep it pushing. You know, keep it pushing. You know, that is a prayer. You know, that is a prayer. But you are, as men, demonstrating what God wants demonstrated in his home. All right? Notice I said his home, not yours. Okay? See, so we have to be men that will do that. What does it take? What does it take? I know we all have busy schedules. <clears throat> you may be at work. It's all right. You know, we got a thing called cell phone now. Y'all know that, right? And they got speaker phones on. You can hear them. You, people can hear you out loud. You can call home and say, put me on speaker. And you know what? You can pray for your family right there. Why are you driving and keep it pushing? See, we have to be the ones. And the same with you ladies. Okay. If the man is at work, you need to step up into that place and say, Dad is at work, but I'm going to pray today. This is how we exercise our faith. See, what you see me and my wife, you, 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 you don't know the story where we came from. <laughs> now, you don't know the story. <laughs> she and I know the story, and some of those, some people that have been around us, you know, from the time we met to now, they know the story. And see, I ain't ashamed to say it. I was a fool going somewhere to be a bigger fool. Uh-huh. See, but y'all, no, no, I'm, I'm a, I'm, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was in the neighborhood. <laughs> but see, what many of you don't know, my wife and I were divorced. When I went to the penitentiary, my wife, look, I, I got to tell this story. I get called up into the counselor's office. And he said, I got good news and bad. And I'm like, oh, man, what the heck is this dude talking about? He said, I got your divorce papers, and we want you to sign them. <laughs> I said, okay. But check this out. After 18 years, God brought me and my wife back together. And see, I tell her today, I said, I ain't mad at you for divorcing me. Because if I could have divorced me, I would have did that. I didn't want to be around me. So see, don't tell me change can't happen. See, don't tell me change can happen, cannot happen. 
So you're looking at a person that, yes, did many years in the institution, but by the grace of God, check it out. Every institution I was in, I've been back in to preach, except for one. And that's Soledad. I've been in seven institutions to preach the gospel. And them brothers came because they knew when I was on the yard. Okay? So don't tell me that God won't use your life to be an example. See? You got to know that God can turn any situation around, any person around, if you allow him to do that. Amen. Now, all I'm asking you to do is allow God to direct you. Know that no matter where you're at and what your situation is, you're an overcomer. Amen? Amen. 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 To our internet viewers, social media viewers, man, so glad that you tuned in. We, we appreciate you taking the time to support our broadcast. If there's anybody listening to me today and you haven't accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, I'd like to give you that opportunity now to just confess with your mouth and believe in your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? That's all it is, Romans 10, 9, and 10. Okay? For those of you that may be listening to me that, you know what, you got in the way, you know, you kind of backslid, you, you kind of got away from it. Man, just ask God to forgive you and come on back. That's as easy as it is. And just go from there. That's it. That's it. You know? And those of you that are looking for a good church home, I pray that you find that. But you find a church that's teaching the Bible. Not, not, not a man's opinion. Teaching what thus says the Lord. Okay? So that you can grow, so that you can develop, so that you can learn to be successful in this life. Because God desires for you to be successful. You desire for yourself to be successful. So, if you were able to do that, praise God. Praise God. And know this, and I mean this with all my heart, speaking to everyone here and those of you online. Man, I love you with all of my heart. I have such a compassion for God's people. And I want to see you successful in every area of your life. Every area of your life. To me, that's the biggest blessing that I can get as a pastor, to see you grow, to see you develop. You know? Also, to my brother and sister John and Charmaine, my wife and I, again, congratulations to Mr. and Mrs. Green. God bless you. God bless you. Y'all worked me for five months in pre-marriage. Anyway, <laughs> you're done. You got it. Love y'all. God bless. I'm out. All right. I pray that each of you got something out of that message. If there's any questions,